get started. So last of my three lectures here is on the autonomic nervous system. And again, we'll be talking a lot about acetylcholine and some other neurotransmitters here. And so I know you've had the anatomy of the autonomic nervous system, so I'll be focusing here on the function of the autonomic nervous system, which means self-governing or functioning independent of the conscious control, right? And so uh, we have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. I'm not going to really talk about the enteric system, but the, um, a little bit, a big picture of the anatomy. So we will talk about a preganglionic neuron for both sympathetics and parasympathetics that are in the central nervous system. Okay, and from that, we have a preganglionic fiber that goes out to a ganglion. And then we have a postganglionic fiber that goes out to end organ, whatever function it is, a salivary gland, a pupil, something like that. Okay, and so um, this will make a lot more sense once we get the neuroscience, but you just need to realize that there are areas of the brain that are able to regulate and manipulate the autonomic nervous system. And the hypothalamus we call the head ganglion of the autonomic nervous system. And again, for now, you do not need to know this, but the hypothalamus is in this area right here. Okay, and so um, we'll talk about how the hypothalamus is able to activate uh, the sympathetic system. We'll just give that as an example. But even above the hypothalamus, there are areas in the brain, which again, you don't need to know about for now, but we'll talk much more about in the neuroscience course, the amygdala. Okay, and now again, this pointer is not working here. Um, but the amygdala here and the hippocampus. And since I'm going to mention these just a little bit, I wanted you to have kind of a bird's eye view of about uh, where these are located in the um, central nervous system. Okay, so it's kind of helpful to think of parasympathetic and sympathetic as a brake accelerator. Okay, so the parasympathetic rest and digest. So digesting food when you're more sedentary, parasympathetic system is going to be more active. Sympathetic, uh, just oversimplified, but uh, fight or flight, um, you know, when something happens and our blood pressure goes up, we get excited, we need to do something quickly, uh, that would be the function of the sympathetic um, system. Now, let's, we're going to contrast sympathetics and parasympathetics with what we talked about last time. Somatic motor neurons, and when you hear that term, think of voluntary control of movement. Okay, and so this was our subject last time. We talked about how we have neuromuscular junctions uh, here where acetylcholine is released and it binds to nicotinic receptors, right? And so we have neuromuscular junctions um, for certain cranial nerves, right? To move your eyes, to move your face, to swallow. Those are all neuromuscular junctions. So we have cranial nerves that are involved here with acetylcholine neuromuscular junctions. And in the spinal cord, I mentioned we have these anterior horn cells, which are the nerves in the spinal cord that initiate an action potential um, to move your arms and legs. Okay, so the point really here is to contrast. There, we have acetylcholine um, here being released, stimulating nicotinic receptors, and we gave the three main neurologic conditions here that can affect the neuromuscular um, junction. Okay, so contrast that here with parasympathetics. And we will see here on this side that the parasympathetics are located in what's called a craniosacral distribution. So there are certain cranial nerves that have parasympathetic fibers with them. So here is the preganglionic neuron right here. Okay, and we also have down in the sacral cord important parasympathetic neurons. Okay, so this then would be the preganglionic fiber going out to a ganglion right here. And so what's released here at the ganglion is acetylcholine on N2 receptors or nicot nicotinic 2 receptors. And that's really important. Notice at the neuromuscular junction, I called them N1, nicotinic 1 receptors. These are morphologically different than the nicotinic receptors on muscle. And so um, when we talked about myasthenia gravis last time, remember you have antibodies against nicotinic receptors, but those are only the N1 receptors on muscle. Okay, so myasthenia does not involve here this synapse on the ganglion. 
Okay, so from the ganglion, we have the postganglionic fiber right here, in this case going out to the pupil. And so all of these for the parasympathetic system, and we'll go through the function of all of this, um, on the end organ for the pupil, salivary glands, heart, lungs, GI tract, bowel and bladder, it's all acetylcholine being released, but on muscarinic receptors, okay? Not nicotinic receptors. And this will be really important. Um, you can't understand side effects of certain medications um, unless you realize this, because there are some medications that block muscarinic receptors, but not nicotinic receptors, okay? So when you think of parasympathetics, the target organ action is always acetylcholine muscarinic receptors. Okay, for sympathetics, the preganglionic neurons are located mainly in the thoracic cord and down to about L2 or L3. Okay, so again, here's the preganglionic neurons here are from T1 to L3. Okay, and so we'll talk about a uh, preganglionic fiber that goes out to certain ganglia, and some of these are closer, some of these are further away. Okay, and just like with the parasympathetics, it's acetylcholine N2 nicotinic receptors, okay? But now, for the most part, once we get out to the, the uh, target organ here, pupil, salivary glands, lungs, heart, and so on, for the most part, you want to associate sympathetics with norepinephrine and epinephrine, okay? Not acetylcholine muscarinic receptors, with one exception. Anytime there's an exception, that's often a kind of a ripe question then to ask you, and that is acetylcholine is utilized by the sympathetics on muscarinic receptors for sweat glands. Okay, so everything else, it's norepinephrine and epinephrine on alpha and beta uh, receptors, adrenergic receptors. Okay, and so we'll talk about these ganglia and uh, go into this in some detail. So let's start with a sympathetic system. So I said these are located throughout the thoracic cord and into the upper part of the lumbar cord. Um, and they have a very distinct location right here. This is the nucleus right here. It's kind of in this, well, we call it the intermedial lateral cell column. So it's, this is the gray matter here of the spinal cord. A bunch of neurons are in here. And so the sympathetics are in this kind of intermediate portion, lateral portion, okay? So we can identify those in the thoracic and upper lumbar cord. So those are the preganglionic neurons. Okay, and from there, um, these go out to specific ganglia. And let's talk first about um, this. And I'm gonna go over the anatomy kind of quickly because we're gonna focus on the function. So we have the paravertebral ganglia, so or sometimes called the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic trunk. Okay, and so we have the preganglionic fiber going out here to this ganglia. And the ganglia, by and large, are named by their level along the spinal cord. But we have some that are lumped together. So C1 through 4 all kind of form one big ganglia. And we call that the superior cervical ganglia. Um, that's an important one, as we'll see, for control of the pupil. Uh, C5 and 6 are kind of lumped together as the middle cervical. Uh, C7 and 8, inferior cervical. Uh, and with T1, we call that the stellate ganglion. So these are all larger ganglia um, here, uh, again, activated by the sympathetic system. So here just showing T1 and T2, uh, and uh, we'll go into this pathway in a little bit here as it relates to the eye and the pupil. Okay, but so we have a preganglionic uh, fiber here that in this case is going up to the superior cervical ganglion and then we'll follow that postganglionic fiber out to its target tissue. And we'll make a big deal about this with the pupil because there's a very common syndrome if we have a lesion of this sympathetic supply um, up here to the pupil and to the blood vessels and sweat glands of the face. Okay, so here's just a drawing showing you, um, again here, this is the preganglionic neuron. And so here's the preganglionic fiber in purple Okay, in this case, going out to these paravertebral ganglion. And sometimes one uh, axon here may stimulate several different paravertebral ganglion. And so this enters right here. And notice it's labeled down here as the white ramus. So this purple here is going through the white ramus. And that's to indicate 
um, that it's myelinated. Okay, so the preganglionic fiber is myelinated, goes in and synapses in the paravertebral ganglion right here. Okay, and then this exits right here, and here it's labeled in the gray ramus, and so this is unmyelinated. Okay, myelin we'll see looks white, and so we, a white ramus is myelinated, gray is unmyelinated, and then this goes out here, travels along with the nerves to our target, uh, target um, organs, and we have some function that we'll talk about. Okay, so these are what we've talked about so far here, these paravertebral or sympathetic chain ganglion. Okay, and so this one just shows you here going to the pupil, to the salivary glands, to the lungs, and to the heart. And so again, everything that is shown here would be uh, norepinephrine predominantly on these alpha or beta uh, adrenergic receptors. Sweat glands are not shown uh, on this diagram, but of course you have sweat glands on your face and chest, and so those are um, acetylcholine muscarinic. Okay, another uh, set of ganglia here that are involved are called prevertebral or sometimes collateral ganglia, and these are shown right here. Okay, so notice now the preganglionic fiber, it actually passes through the um, paravertebral ganglion to synapse out here on these prevertebral ganglia. Okay, and these uh, by and large lie along the aorta and so their ganglia are named by the specific arteries uh, that they're adjacent to. So we talk about a celiac ganglion or a superior or inferior mesenteric ganglion um, and so on. And so here we see a preganglionic fiber exiting, okay, and, but it passes through the sympathetic chain ganglia on its way here to a prevertebral ganglia. That's where the synapse occurs, okay? And so now the postganglionic fiber here from these ganglia will supply the GI tract, pancreas, bladder, reproductive organs, heart, lungs, um, a, a wide uh, distribution. Okay, and so these fibers here that pass through the paravertebral ganglion or the sympathetic trunk, uh, trunk um, are called splanchnic nerves. So here we see the greater splanchnic nerve going down to the um, celiac plexus, um, superior mesenteric, and so on. So these would all be our prevertebral ganglion um, right here. <coughs> okay, so we've talked about the um, paravertebral, uh, the prevertebral ganglia. And just to make a, um, a big point about a difference between sympathetics and parasympathetics, Okay, here are the parasympathetics that we've been talking about, paravertebral and prevertebral. This is a little misleading. These prevertebral ganglion are actually not that far away from the spinal cord. But the, the big picture is that for the sympathetics, the preganglionic fiber is actually pretty short, whether it's going to paravertebral or prevertebral. Whereas with the parasympathetics, um, this is something we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, the vagus nerve, all of this, is a preganglionic fiber. So the parasympathetics have a very, very long preganglionic fiber and then a very short little postganglionic fiber here, um, in this case, supplying the heart. Okay, so maybe let's just back up here and now talk about what do the sympathetics do. Again, think of flight or flight. So with regards to the pupil, well, it's advantageous you know, in an emergency situation that your pupil is large. You can take in as much vision as possible. So the sympathetics would enlarge the pupil. Uh, we don't really care about salivating to digest food um, in an emergency situation. So the sympathetics inhibit salivation. Um, you want to get as much oxygen um, in a fight or flight situation. And so sympathetics are gonna kind of open the bronchioles so we oxygenate as much as possible. Um, of course, your heart is going to accelerate, okay? We need oxygen. We need blood flow. So sympathetics will activate the heart. And all of the things here with regards to the GI tract and the pancreas involved in digestion are going to be inhibited um, by uh, sympathetics, okay? And sympathetics are not interested in, you know, going to the bathroom. That's parasympathetic function, so it's going to actually act against the function of the bowel and bladder, um, in an emergency situation. 
Okay, one other uh, anatomically interesting part of the sympathetics is the adrenal medulla, which you really should just think of a displaced um, autonomic ganglion. It's part of the sympathetic system. And so um, in this case, we can see this preganglionic fiber, and it actually passes through all of these ganglia we've talked about, the paravertebral, the prevertebral, and it goes all the way out to the adrenal medulla. So it's just a displaced sympathetic ganglia. Okay, and so in the adrenal medulla, when we went through the catecholamine neurotransmitter cascade and all the enzymes, the adrenal medulla has all of the enzymes necessary to go from dopamine to norepinephrine and all the way down to epinephrine. And so for the most part, the adrenal medulla makes epinephrine by about an 80 to 20. The rest would be some norepinephrine, but mainly epinephrine. Okay, but one important uh, distinction of the adrenal medulla compared to the rest of the sympathetic system is that this is just released into the bloodstream and it has a systemic effect on the entire body. Okay, the other things we've talked about are like a point-to-point -point relationship to the pupil, to the salivary glands, to the heart, to the lungs. Um, so very precise anatomical relationship. With the adrenal medulla, it just blasts the whole body with epinephrine. Okay, and so it has a very strong uh, systemic effect. Okay, now remember I said that the hypothalamus is the head ganglion of the autonomic nervous system? So the hypothalamus can activate all of these preganglionics in the thoracic cord, okay? But it also has a direct way to activate the adrenal medulla. And this is called the hypothalamus pituitary um, axis here, that it can sends out um, a neurotransmitter that you'll learn about to activate the adrenal medulla. And this releases glucocorticoids. Um, cortisol would be the most important. So in an extreme stressful situation, um, the sympathetics activate the adrenal gland to release cortisol, which can help with, um, again, um, sympathetic function. So here's the hypothalamus. And I'm don't, you don't need to know any of this slide. I just, it was the only one I could find to show you the hypothalamus here through release of ACTH activates the adrenal gland to release um, cortisol and other glucocorticoids. Okay, so here's a summary of sympathetic function. Elevated heart rate and blood pressure. Mobilization of fuel stores for muscle and fat because we need activity. We need the muscle to be able to have everything it needs for the fight or flight action. Pupils dilate, piloerection, so the hairs stand on end. And sweating, which I underline just to remind you that sweating is the only one that involves acetylcholine, muscarinic receptors. Blood vessels in the skin and GI tract constrict because you don't want blood flow to those areas. You want blood flow to the muscles, right? So the sympathetics will constrict blood vessels that aren't needed, increase bladder sphincter tone, okay, because um, parasympathetics is involved in voiding. Bronchioles dilate, so we get lots of oxygen. Um, and then it works against GI tract um, peristalsis. Okay, so we can kind of go through every single one of those as a sympathetic function. Now, um, don't worry about this slide, but it's like for three consecutive years at this point in the lecture, I've always been asked the question, how come you hear about people peeing their pants, you know, when there is some excitement? Isn't that... That's not sympathetic. So uh, I'm anticipating your question here, and I'm going to answer it. Um, so there are areas of the brain that can regulate and control the sympathetics, and it's a lot of complex neuroanatomy that uh, obviously you don't need to know about. But in, ex in an extreme panicky situation, these areas of the brain that can kind of regulate you know, and normally choose, are we activating sympathetic or parasympathetics, they just get overloaded and flooded with too much information. And then it can actually trigger the opposite response, that the normal reaction during fight or flight is to inhibit the bladder function. But if the brain gets overloaded, uh, so to speak, then the sympathetics can act inappropriately. And occasionally you can have voiding um, during an emergency situation. Okay, But it would take a long time going through all these different areas of the brain, which obviously is not necessary for now. So I'll just give a little illustration of what happens in a fight or flight. So you know, as a, as a parallel here, we have something going on at a school. Someone pulls the fire alarm, and that triggers a call to a 911 operator who, via 
a radio tower sends out a signal to fire department, police department, and we have emergency responders that go to the scene, and then you have a police chief or someone that determines, you know, did some kid just pull the fire alarm or is there really an emergency? And so the decision is made, do we need to send more responders or do we just shut it down? Okay, so let's use that as kind of an analogy for what happens to activate the sympathetic uh, system. So the fire alarm um, here in the brain that, that activates, you know, if you hear a loud noise outside your window and you're wondering what's going on and your heart rate goes up, well, it's the amygdala that becomes activated. So this is kind of like the, um, you know, the alarm switch that gets pulled initially to activate the uh, sympathetic system. Okay, but remember the, the amygdala, well, you don't know this, so sorry to say remember, but the hypothalamus is the head ganglion for the autonomic nervous system. So the amygdala has to activate the hypothalamus to get things going. So the hypothalamus then can activate all of these preganglionic neurons in the T1 to L3, okay, to activate the whole sympathetic system. And remember, it also can activate via ACTH, the adrenal gland, to release epinephrine systemically, okay? And so the hypothalamic pituitary axis, this is kind of like uh, the 911 operator in your brain that can get that signal out to the emergency departments, okay? And so we have amygdala, hypothalamus, and the, the pituitary here that can release the necessary neurotransmitters to activate the sympathetic. Um, and then the sympathetic nervous system, those T1 to L3, the adrenal gland, this is kind of like the, um, the police departments, the fire stations, and the neurotransmitters then, norepinephrine and epinephrine, these are the emergency responders that are actually going out to activate specific tissue to do all of those things we just talked about, elevate your heart rate, dilate your pupils, and so on. But then something has to happen in the brain to determine you know, okay, is someone really breaking into your house? If so, we need to even amplify this whole thing. Or was it just a false alarm? Okay, and so the areas in the brain, there are several, but for now the hippocampus is one of those areas um, that can, uh, and along with the, an area of the frontal lobe called the prefrontal cortex, but that's for later, that can kind of rationally determine do we need more or do we need less? And so if you determine it was nothing, then the whole thing uh, gets shut down which doesn't happen quickly. You know, if you've been alerted out of sleep, it often takes a little while to calm down and, you know, for things to settle back down to normal. So what can happen uh, very significantly in an abnormal situation is anxiety disorders, uh, individuals that have panic attacks, and what I see a lot over at the VA is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And these individuals can have uh, abnormal activation of the sympathetic system. It doesn't take much, it doesn't take an intruder, but a, a minor or even times no stimuli, just a thought, will then trigger activation of the sympathetic system. And uh, the reason we're really learning to take this seriously is that abnormal frequent activation of the sympathetic system is associated with chronic illness and disease, and it's felt that inappropriate activation releases these inflammatory cytokines and can actually damage parts of the brain. Um, including the hippocampus, um, which is sort of where you're supposed to be able to, you know, rationally determine whether this is actually an emergency or not. And so there actually is some harm to areas of the brain that are normally part of the feedback loop that helps you to shut it down. And so if you lose that feedback loop, then, you know, veterans that I see with PTSD, um, they just can't get out of it. It just keeps activating again and again and again. So we are trying to be really aggressive with these to um, stop this before it ends up um, having a harmful effect on the nervous system. Okay, there is one focal lesion of the sympathetic systems that is extremely high yield. Um, so I tell students in neuroscience course, this is certainly a top 10 question, board question for neuroscience anyway, and that is a lesion of the sympathetic pathway to the pupil. And this is remarkably complex. So remember I said the hypothalamus here is the head ganglion of the autonomic nervous system. And in this case, we're just going to follow how the hypothalamus activates here these upper, mainly T1, T2 preganglionic neurons. So this is a sympathetic system. 
So here we have a preganglionic fiber, and this loops all the way over the lung, around the subclavian artery, on its way to the superior cervical ganglion. Okay? And so remember the sympathetics function to dilate the pupil. And so please don't, um, we will do this in neuroscience. Don't try to memorize exactly where this pathway goes. I just want the big picture for now is that this goes out to dilate the pupil. Okay, it travels along with some blood vessels, really complex route. And it also supplies a muscle that elevates your eyelid here in small print here, Mueller's muscle. Okay, and there's also, here's a pathway from the sympathetics that goes out to blood vessels and sweat glands on the face. So remember, this would be acetylcholine muscarinic receptors. Okay, so the normal function here of this pathway is to dilate your pupil, to raise your eyelid just a little bit, and to supply blood vessels and sweat glands. So the complicated thing here is if you have a lesion anywhere from the hypothalamus down to T1, from T1 uh, out to the superior cervical ganglion or even along all these blood vessels, then you affect the ability of all three of those things to happen. And that's called a Horner's syndrome. Okay? So this patient has a right Horner's syndrome and notice the pupil is smaller. Okay, because we've lost the supply, that sympathetic supply to the pupil to dilate the pupil. So the pupil becomes a bit smaller. And often this is kind of subtle, but you can see we have a droopy eyelid right here. Okay, so that's loss of supply to Mueller's muscle. Okay, a droopy eyelid we call ptosis. You don't pronounce the, the P, ptosis. A little droopy eyelid. Okay, now notice if you dim the room lights, okay, what normally happens when you dim the room lights? The pupils get bigger. Okay, and so this is the normal eye here. There's no problem. This pupil gets larger, but because you've knocked out the sympathetic somewhere along here, this pupil doesn't dilate. So oftentimes just dimming the room lights can make that pupil asymmetry become, you know, very, very dramatic. Okay, so Horner syndrome, the triad is meiosis, which means a small pupil, um, ptosis, droopy eyelid, and anhydrosis is the lack of sweating. Okay, and so who gets this? Well, for now, and the board question is usually a tumor right here at the apex of the lung. Okay, so these are smokers, and oftentimes I've, I've seen quite a few of these. The patient is seeing me for something else, and I notice they've got a Horner syndrome, and that should always prompt doing uh, an investigation of the lungs to look for lung cancer. So there are other lesions here that could cause this, but for now, uh, just recognize a, a tumor at the apex of the lung would disrupt these preganglionic fibers um, right here. Okay, so far we just talked about the efferents of the sympathetics. There are afferents as well, and these come from all over the body. And I'll just mention here um, how this is related to signaling painful information. So, for example, let's say our patient has a gastric ulcer. Okay, well, that, these fibers travel with sympathetics, in this case through the ciliary ganglion going in, okay? And uh, the, the key thing with this is this syndrome or what's called referred pain and how we're not very good really at localizing pain, especially in the internal organs. And the reason for that is that um, where you sense pain seems to be entirely dependent on which nerve roots these pain fibers enter. So in the case of a gastric ulcer, this goes through T6 nerve roots to the spinal cord. And so um, maybe this is not bad for a gastric ulcer. A patient's going to have pain in about a T6 uh, dermatomal distribution. But where it gets confusing is if we have myocardial ischemia, heart attack, um, and these, the pain fibers from the heart um, get into the spinal cord through the T1 to T5 dermatomes. So if we just come back here, notice that T1 goes down the arm. All right, so that's why myocardial ischemia, um, it's often kind of rather confusing. The patient can have pain going down the arm, and that's because these, those fibers are entering with the T1 uh, dermatome. Liver and gallbladder pain tends to localize to the tip of the right scapula, okay? And diaphragm pain, because it enters through C3 and C5, uh, tends to localize to shoulder pain. 
Okay, so that's why the, the pain of some of these things, you know, you can't tie it directly to the organ that's affected. But that appears to be the mechanism for um, referred pain. Okay, so now let's talk about the parasympathetic uh, system over here on this side. Okay, so we'll notice the organs here are the same, but it has, if you know what happens with the sympathetics, then let's just say it's exactly the opposite for the parasympathetics and you'll be correct. Okay, so remember we have acetylcholine on N2 receptors going out to entirely for the parasympathetics, it's acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors. But now it's to constrict the pupil. Okay, um, the opposite of sympathetics. Parasympathetics, it's rest and digest. So anything that helps with digestion, so stimulating the salivary glands would be a function of parasympathetics. Parasympathetics slow down the heart. Okay, and in contrast to sympathetics, it constricts the bronchioles. Okay, and it's involved with anything with the liver, pancreas, or GI tract that promotes digestion. Okay, and then we have our S234 down here, because remember it's craniosacral um, that would be involved in um, uh, emptying the bladder, uh, bowel and bladder function. Okay, so I know here right before exams, and this is not neuroanatomy, but there's just one named area that would just be a high enough yield here that I think I'll, I'll mention it here. You should know this. These are the cranial nerves that have a parasympathetic contribution. So it's 3, 7, 9, and 10. Those are the cranial nerves that have a parasympathetic component. And for cranial nerve 3, Dr. Shankel will talk about this uh, quite a bit in her lecture on the physical exam. Um, the preganglionic neuron has a name. It's called the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. Okay, that's important that you know. We will talk about it many, many times. And so the preganglionic fiber, the, the named ganglion here is important. It's called the ciliary ganglion. And then from there, that goes out to the pupil to constrict the pupil. Okay, so Edinger-Westphal nucleus, um, ciliary ganglion for cranial nerve 3. Okay, so the ability uh, tearing and the salivary glands is a function of parasympathetics. So this goes with uh, seven, the superior salivatory nucleus. And so this goes out through specific named ganglia that uh, anatomy will ask you, but, um, but I won't, that either go out to the eyes for tearing or to the submandibular sublingual glands for salivation. Okay, for the parotid gland, this comes from cranial nerve nine. And the preganglionic neurons here are the inferior salivatory nucleus. This goes out to otic ganglion and to the parotid gland. Okay, so no Edinger-Westphal nucleus. The other one I think is super important is the parasympathetic contribution to the vagus nerve. And that is called the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Okay, and so this is the pathway that goes to the lungs to constrict uh, the bronchioles. This goes to the heart to slow down the heart. Supplies the GI tract and anything involved in digestion, so it stimulates peristalsis. Um, stimulates the gallbladder to release bile. Okay. And in neuroscience, we will talk a lot about incoming information to the vagus nerve. And so that any stretch of blood receptors, like when your blood pressure goes up, that information is triggered and goes up in, uh, through the vagus nerve to the brain. Um, and so, but that's, uh, we'll talk about that reflex later. Last thing uh, here is the S234. Remember, it's craniosacral for parasympathetics. And so uh, these stimulate the descending colon for digestion. Remember, every single thing we talk about parasympathetics, it's acetylcholine, muscarinic receptors. Uh, acts on the bladder and on the rectum, and, and later on we'll go through the detailed anatomy of how that works, and also supplies the reproductive organs, which, which I won't talk about. Okay, and so um, again, for parasympathetics, we're constricting the pupil, we're stimulating salivation, we're slowing the heart, constricting the bronchioles, stimulating the GI tract, emptying the bowel and bladder. Okay, here's just a good example of why this is very, very practical to know. A common group of medications that we use um, in medicine are tricyclic antidepressants. Um, they're used for depression, but we also use them in neurology because they actually work very well for different pain syndromes. And tricyclic antidepressants, 
um, have a function to block muscarinic receptors. Okay, and so um, the, the two of the common ones that are used are amitriptyline and nortriptyline. And so when you prescribe these medications and you want to tell a patient, here are some side effects you could have with this medication, um, easier than just remembering a list is if you have the big picture of the anatomy here, you can just kind of go through and think, okay, well, what could happen if we block muscarinic receptors on the pupil? Um, well, that's going to affect the ability to constrict the pupil, and oftentimes that can cause some blurred vision. So blurred vision would be a side effect. If you block the muscarinic receptors here on salivary glands, this is actually the most common side effect of these medications. Patients complain of a dry mouth. Okay, by far, that's, that's the most common side effect. You affect muscarinic receptors on the heart. And so um, remember the parasympathetics normally want to slow the heart down. And so we can get an increased heart rate. That's called tachycardia um, as a side effect of these medications. It's one reason... We want to be very careful prescribing these medications if a patient has any um, cardiac condition. Um, especially on the GI tract, the parasympathetics stimulate peristalsis. So if you block that, then what do you think a side effect will be? Constipation, and that's very common. Um, and so again, you'd want to think if you already have a patient who has constipation, well, this is probably not a good medication to prescribe that for that patient. It's going to get worse. And urinary retention is another uh, side effect, and especially in men who maybe have prostate problems, uh, we would probably avoid these medications because it would work against um, emptying the bladder. Okay, so remember amitriptyline and nortriptyline and atropine is another uh, medication that selectively um, will affect the uh, muscarinic receptors. Okay, so a knowledge of the anatomy here is um, rather practical. All right, any questions? Good, good luck on exams. Thanks very much.